Well, I'm so happy to be the one interviewing this person. He wears many hats, worship leader, radio and TV personality, and now he's also an author. However, above all that, he's my friend and my brother, Muiwa Olarewaju. You're in the hot seat now. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Simi. Be gentle. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what? I would describe you as an onion because you have so many layers. There's you so much nice to you. You smell. <laughs> no. You just have so many layers. There's so much about you, especially that you just wrote a book called Upside Down, Turning Worship on Its Head, Where Effectiveness Has Been Measured by Feelings. So what inspired you to write that? It's the many experiences I've had over the years of traveling around. I mean, everywhere from Ghana to Nigeria to Russia to here in the States and found that we, we most generally measure the worship experience by how I feel. Oh, worship was good today. I, I felt good. Uh, and uh, most generally you find people want the, uh, the Chronicles experience. And you, I hear, I mean, when I was younger, preachers used to say to me, we well, just we well, pray harder, so when you lift your hands, people will just fall over, and and, and I, it confused me. And and as I've grown older, I realized, you know, uh, that's just the landmark. And I have a, a saying at the moment: the landmark is not the destination, because in Chronicles, people, uh, people, the glory of God was so strong. Ministers couldn't minister, yes, but then we have something called the John 4 model, at least I call it that, where Jesus describes what true worship is. And it's an interesting conversation if you ever looked at it. He doesn't talk about the glory being so strong that you're falling over. He talks about spirit and in truth. And when you look at the text, the, the, the word spirit there is a small s. And in the original text, that's talking about your attitude, your mind and your being. And then truth there is truth as opposed to, it's not truth as opposed to uh, uh, lies, but types and shadows. So me copying you to try and be you would be types and shadows. So Jesus is saying that true worship is about fixing your attitude and being authentic, uh, as opposed to, oh, the glory was so strong, we fell over. And that's what we, a lot of us are looking for. That's what we aspire for, that the glory would be so strong. And then we get out in traffic and get mad at the man that crosses us and you this and that and the other. Well, you know, speaking of being authentic, I mm. want to talk about a chapter in your book, Upside Down. Yeah. And you talked about your father and what happened to him. And you say that worship, um, being authentic in your worship after that helped you get through. It was, it was an interesting experience. I remember uh, my, my father, I was in the West Indies. I hadn't seen my father in almost 20 years. And the very week I decided I was going to see him, uh, I went away with a friend of mine. We went to the West Indies and I was in a church singing. And I remember a young lady, she was so joyous. It was, it was infectious. So I said to them, what's wrong with her? They said, oh, she just lost her father. And I stand up in church before I sing and say, I don't know what I will do if they tell me my father's dead. Not knowing that very night my father was being assassinated. So now when I was told the next day, I had a question to ask myself. I had a decision to make. How do I respond to this? I mean, it was heartbreaking. But for me, it was, the same thing happened with my mother, actually. It was a question of, uh, what would I render unto God for all his benefits? And my reasonable response, I will lift up the cup of my salvation, the assembly of the brethren. And that happens a lot in our lives. You, you, you have a point where, do you say, God, why? Or do you say, you know what, for you are good and your mercies endures forever and your faithfulness throughout all generations. Shall I keep on talking? Because I can talk all night about <laughs> I this. I know you know. can. But, you know, I want I wanted to talk about your struggles as a child. Mm. I mean, you describe how it was actually a traumatic experience. So talk about that. You said um, that you actually considered being a male escort. How, okay. What got I, you to that point? I, I was tell you, curious. I considered many things. I remember finishing my, um, when I left, when I was sent back to the UK by, by my parents, I remember my father uh, saying to me, uh, remember whose son you are, uh, and giving me an emblem of what we stood for. I, I took away something that reminded me of home, reminded me of my father, reminded me of our culture, which is why I wear the scarves that I wear. Uh, and, I, and I remember uh, I came from a comfortable environment, came from, I mean, went to private schools, we were, we were comfortable. Then I get to London, it was horrific. I, I was working by the age of 13. At one point, I was, I was so depressed, I wanted to jump off Tower Bridge. Uh, and I remember going through all that, finishing university. I'm sitting on the train, 
having left Westminster University where I did my music degree. No money, prospects look dim. I read a paper, and uh, one of our broadsheets, the New uh, the Times, and it chronicled the journey of uh, some students from Eton. Eton is one of the best schools in our country, has nine prime ministers who went to it. These kids had gone to Eton, but their prospects were so bad, they ended up being male escorts. So I thought, well, if that's them, what hope do I have? Now, I'm in church, I'm worship leader, I'm loving Jesus, but the pressures of the economics were so bad. And then I thought, what if one of my customers and my mother's friend? Oh, OMG, no. I'll get killed. That's that. Okay, so <laughs> what was your turning point from that? My point? turning point was my turning point was having an experience with God again and again back in my small uh, church, the Apostolic Church, which is where I experienced uh, uh, being a worship leader, even though I was a bad one back then. Uh, but just the joy of music, the joy of worship, reminded me again as I cried over and over again that uh, there is a hope so sure that I am not alone. That He places. Uh, the lonely families, and, and I was able to find myself again and find my sanity before my mother got to me. Now, we're almost out of time, but not only have you written a book, but you have this album. So what was the, what's your favorite thing about this album? About my favorite album? thing about the album is it chronicles my journey. I, it's called Ekoile, uh, which is Lagos, my, my first all African album. I talk about being an African, being proud of it. I talk about the fact that God makes no mistakes. Uh, then we go to South Africa and, and say, uh, which is see what God has done. We go to Jambo, we go to Kenya. Uh, we have a, the whole album is just a, a collage of great colors uh, from Africa. Uh, so I love it because it's allowed me for the first time to express my Africanness wholly. Because I walk around telling people, my name is and that's just like five seconds of my party piece. This one, this is a whole hour of Africanness that's coming from me. Yes, it is. In Jesus' name. And it's a beautiful hour. I enjoyed the album. I enjoyed your book. And thank you for letting me steal the show for a little bit. I'll hand it right back to you. Thank you. Give me back my show. <laughs>